This is session five of Explore the Bible, uh, the study of Proverbs and Song of Solomon. The title of our lesson is Following God's Design, and the text is Proverbs chapter 5, verses 3 through 11, and verses 15 through 18. The lesson summary statement for our lesson is God expects his people to show his wisdom through sexual purity. The way I'm thinking of starting my class on Sunday is just having this statement written on the board. The young man who rings the bell at the brothels is unconsciously looking for God. The young man who rings the bell at the brothel is unconsciously looking for God. I was going to have that written on the board. That sometimes contributed to G.K. Chesterton, but actually the author of that statement is a man by the name of Bruce Marshall. And so I put it on the board so that they can see it, begin to think about it, probably will have some discussions about it even before the class begins. And then I'm going to start the class and then ask them, what do you suppose this statement means? The young man who rings the bell at the brothel is unconsciously looking for God. And apparently what the author was saying that, saying in that statement is there is this search for intimacy. And we will even look in the wrong places and in the wrong ways in order to satisfy this desire we have for intimacy, to be known and to know. And God has put this longing in our heart to draw us to him. But so oftentimes we go in the wrong directions and in the wrong ways to fulfill that. Sometimes you can see this fulfilled in people's workaholism. They're trying to find this sense of meaning and satisfaction. Maybe it's in some other kinds of addictions that are out there. Other times it may be uh, with an investment in their children. They're trying to find this kind of satisfaction this inner to meet this inner longing in their heart. Does the summary statement seem obvious to you? God expects his people to show his wisdom through sexual purity. Well, apparently it isn't. According to Christian Mingle Survey, 61% of self-identified Christian singles said they were willing to have casual sex without being in love. 61%. Only 23% said they would have to be in love to have sex before marriage. Only 11% in this Christian Mingle survey said they were waiting to have sex until they were married. As Christians, we are, we're needing to do something more than telling people, don't do this. They need to know the wisdom of purity, and they need to know how to follow God's design. So this is a very appropriate lesson for our day. Now Solomon knows that one of the top challenges for young adults is in this area of sexual temptation. And so in these first chapters of Proverbs, he addresses this issue five times. In chapter 2, verse 16 to 22. In chapter 5, verse 3 to 25. In chapter 6, verse 24 to 35. In chapter 7, verses 5 through 27. And in chapter 9, verse 13 through 18. So in chapter 2, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 9, he addresses this very issue. That's the significance of it. The very first command that God gave human beings after he created them has to deal with this issue of sexuality. He said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And this may explain why this is such a strong desire on the part of human beings to have sexual intimacy and to be close. Now you'll notice that from that passage in Genesis, it's very selective, it's heterosexual, it is monogamous, and it is long-lasting in its commitment. So what our lesson is doing as we study this passage out of Proverbs chapter 5 is it's teaching us 
how to follow God's design. Now, the first thing that we'll see in following God's design is see the reality. Chapter 5, verses 3 through 6. On the board, I'm going to write two headings, the word addictive and then the word consequences. Now, under the word addictive, I'm going to ask them this question. How is the forbidden woman pictured in verse 3? And that'll give us an opportunity to uh, talk about these different words that are here. Forbidden woman, that means another woman, someone who's not your wife. Uh, the word uh, drip honey is talking about the honey comb that is so filled that it's flowing over with honey. It's that picture and is talking about the sweetest of honey. And of course, honey was the sweetest subject uh, material that they knew in that day and time. It says that her words were smoother than oil. And of course, olive oil was what they knew of that day. And it's conveying the fact that her words are amiable, they're gentle, uh, they're impressive. You can ask your class to give you some thoughts about what those word pictures are trying to convey. But what I'm wanting to ask and lead the class to is what's missing in this description? Well, there's no description of her physically. It's talking about her words. Her words drip honey. Her words are smooth as oil. So what are we talking about here? It's, it's a woman that's appealing to this man's ego. What takes place before the physical attraction is an emotional attraction. And she begins to draw him in that way at the very beginning. If temptation doesn't come to us in a red suit, horns, and a pitchfork, if it did, it'd be easy to resist. No, it comes to us in more subtle ways and draws us in. And this is what is attractive about this woman. She is feeding this man's ego, this young man's. Then on the board is the word consequences. And what Solomon does is he starts at the beginning of this relationship. See, it's not even about the physical at this point. It's the emotional attachment that's taking place. But then in verse 4, he jumps to the very end of what's going to happen if this young man is drawn into that relationship. You'll notice verse 4 says, in the end. So he's talking about uh, consequences here. And, and again, uh, I'm asking what are, the, what are the outcomes for this life if he gets involved with this woman? And then again, that gives you an opportunity to talk about these different words. Uh, for example, uh, if he gets involved with her, the end result is going to be uh, bitter as wormwood. The word bitter is actually a plural, and that was one of the ways the Hebrews could emphasize a word. They didn't have modifiers like the word very. They couldn't say very bitter. And so one of the ways that they would make emphasis is they would make it a plural, uh, like bitters here, or they would multiply the word like holy, holy, holy. In other words, God is very, very holy. But it's a, a plural here, and it's talking about the bitterest. It's an intense word. It's helping this son to just understand this is intensely unpleasant. It is uh, grieving to your soul. This is the outcome that's going to happen. And it also says a sharp, it's like a sharp double-edged sword. What do you suppose Solomon is driving at there? What would a sharp double-edged sword do? Well, of course, uh, it cuts and it's painful. And he's trying to say, you're going to be extremely bitter. It's going to be an extremely unpleasant experience for you. And it's going to be extremely painful. And so how could it be painful for this boy? What are some other kinds of pains that he would experience? Well, there may be physical pain and psychological pain. There's emotional pain. There's going to be financial pain. Uh, he, he, he's saying to, this, to his son, there's nothing you're going to experience that is going to be as hurtful and painful as this woman. Her feet go down to death. Do you see the serious consequences he's putting in front of this boy? 
really what he's doing with all of these things is he's really trying to frighten the boy to see what the consequences are going to be. This could, this is serious consequences. It could lead literally to death. Her, her steps head straight for Sheol. That's just restating it again. Sheol was the grave. And notice that it's not just him, but it's her as well. Both of them have this kind of outcome. She doesn't consider the path of life. The path of life is talking about the ways of God, that that quality of life that God wants to consider. See, that's not a part of her. She doesn't know that her ways are unstable. There is moral confusion in her life. She's improvising on life as she goes along. And I'm sure you've probably known people like that as well. So I'm, I'm talking through that with them and reacting with them and helping them to see the seriousness of the consequences of, of following through with this decision. He, Solomon wants his son to assume that he's going to get caught like his grandfather, David. And if he gets caught, what are going to be the consequences for his having sinned? Well, these things are going to happen. These things really will happen. This is seeing reality. That's what he's wanting to, his son to understand. So following God's design means you, you take a moment and you see the reality. These are the, this is the end result if I follow through with this. God expects his people to show his wisdom through sexual purity. If you're following God's design, you see the reality. But secondly, uh, you think long-term, chapter 5, verse 7 through 11. <clears throat> so the question is, how is he to respond to this woman? And in verse 7, he, he says to the son, So now, sons, it's plural now, Listen to me, don't turn away from the words from my mouth. Now, let's just think for a moment. It's a pause in his describing what's going to happen to these, the son if he gets involved in this. And, and he's appealing for the son to listen to him. And we've all had those occasions when we wanted, we've said to our kids, are you listening to me? So let's back up and see what the context is. What is the big topic we're talking about? Well, we're talking about sex. And so he's just described, this is the danger of what's going to happen to you. And so he says, now, son, I want you to listen to me. I, 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 want, you to, I want you to not turn away from what I'm saying. In other words, he's wanting his son to lean in and listen to what he's saying. And what is... What is the subject that he's talking about? What is he going to say that he wants his son to turn his ear to him and listen to him? Well, the subject is safe sex. Uh, maybe the reason why we're not getting people's attention uh, long enough to present our ideas is we haven't found a way to draw their attention. And this father has done that. He's, he's speaking to his son in such a way his son is wanting to listen. This is something his son is drawn to. And he says, now, son, you heed my words. Don't, don't turn away from my words. So his motivation and his words in verse 7. Now, in verse 8, he gives two commands, but there's one idea. What is the one idea that Solomon is wanting to speak to his son. See in verse 8, keep your way far from her. That's the first command. Don't go near the door of her house. That's the second command. There's two commands, but there's one idea. What is the idea that he's wanting to get across to this son? And the way that I would phrase it, uh, the class will have their interpretations, but basically keep away from temptation. Keep away from temptation. And, and he's saying to this son, there need to be some boundaries in your life. So tell me, what are some boundaries that we need to set on our speech? 
that would protect us from being caught in this kind of sin? What are things that don't need to be said and things that should be said? For example, uh, flirting and teasing. Uh, things like, uh, you know, if I were younger, I'd be interested. Those kinds of things. See, those things, those things reduce modesty and, and make these things make you more vulnerable. There needs to be some clear boundaries on the way we speak. Well, what about boundaries in terms of the way we behave? What are the things that they have? Last, last week, someone brought up in our class uh, Billy Graham's uh, commitment to never be alone with any woman uh, without there being another woman present. Uh, he'd never have lunch with another woman by himself, never ride in a car with another woman by himself. He had, he had set some boundaries, he and his team. It was called the Modesto Manifesto. And, and, and so what are some of those boundaries that a person needs to establish when it comes to the matter of his behavior, to the matter of his touch? Just talk about boundaries. Now, he says in verses 9 through 10, if you don't heed you're going to know loss. And he explains what those losses are in verses 9 and 10. And he said, if you don't heed my words, you're going to experience regret in verse 11. So he mentions these four long-term consequences. The, they are uh, strength, years, finances, and... Um, physical and emotional uh, regrets. So let's just talk about those. He says in verse 9, otherwise you'll give up your vitality. That's talking about a man in the prime of his life, at the best part of his life, the greatest strength of his life. How many of you have known someone who had great promise, but because of their physical sin, their sexual sin, at the height and the greatest uh, part of their strength, they lost it all. We had a neighbor who had a granddaughter that was just brilliant. She wanted to be a medical doctor. She had the brains to do it. She goes to college. Her sophomore year, she gets involved with a young man sexually. She becomes pregnant. And the last that I heard, uh, she was working uh, in a, a daycare, helping to care for children while she completed her schooling, but she is never probably ever going to be a doctor. Now, there's nothing wrong taking care of children in a preschool unless God gave you the abilities to be a medical doctor. And she has, she has lost her vitality when it comes to that. He, he goes on to say that it's not only her strength, but also... Uh, her years, um, the best parts of life, it'll steal away from the best parts of life. Uh, in terms of your finances, uh, I, I was reading and doing some research on this, and, and uh, I don't know that these things are accurate. This is the best that I could find, but the average cost of a divorce, according to bank rate, is $15,000. Uh, alimony, uh, varies, but it's somewhere around uh, $650 a month. I think the figure that I read, it's like 17, 18% of a person's income. Uh, child support, I suppose, I think it was 17% of income. In the 2010 census, uh, the average for um, alimony, I believe it was child support rather, was $430. I mean, it, the point is, is, the sexual sin that leads to divorce leaves families broke. When you drive by a school ground and you see the children out playing, one out of four of those children live in poverty. And the single greatest contributor to that child living in poverty is there is no father in the home that is providing for that family. It means those children have less medical coverage, less educational advantages, no Christmas gifts, no meat for dinner, no trip to the zoo, 
and a much harder future. He's trying to say to this son, do you understand the kind of consequences that this is going to bring into your life? And then in the last part, there's this physical and emotional grief that happens. The word lament speaks about deep grief and uh, the physical body being consumed. There is a, there's actually a physical aspect that could affect you. So those would be ways in which to talk about that. And, and again, you see what the father's doing. He's saying, do you, you need to right now think long-term. This has consequences. Don't think you're going to be the exception and avoid these consequences. And the accumulation of these images that he's giving is, as I said earlier, it's to scare his son. Now, I have a question. When you have had a chance to talk through these issues like vitality and years and resources and lament and physically consumed and so forth, I'd be interested to know from the women in the class, which one of those is the most frightening? Which one is the most alarming? And then which one of those would it be for the men in the class? I remember a counselor speaking once and saying that uh, a couple came in who were on the verge of divorce. Um, the husband wasn't interested in staying in the marriage. And one of the ways the counselor got the man's attention and turned him so that he began to give an emphasis to the marriage and put the marriage back together is he talked to the man, have you considered how much it's going to cost you financially? And that was the way he caught the man's attention. And then they began to build upon that. So the father's using these various means of destruction to make this son think uh, long-term when it comes to this. Following God's design means you see the reality. Following God's design means you think long-term. And then last of all, following God's design means you enjoy God's provision. And again, our lesson summary statement that we're wanting to drive home to the class is God expects his people to show his wisdom through sexual purity. And how do we do that? We enjoy God's provision. The, the answer to illegitimate pleasure is legitimate pleasure. So rather than deny your sexual desire, what he says to the son is it is to be fulfilled through marriage. Not only is sex not bad, but it is to be greatly desired within appropriate boundaries. So I asked the class to let me read verse 15 and let me add some words to kind of catch the flow of what's happening here. And this is the way I would read it. Yes, drink water. In other words, it's legitimate, but from your own cistern. Yes, drink water, but from your own cistern, water flowing from your own well. So he's affirming this sexual passion that he has, that it's a good thing, but it's to be restricted. And then I had asked the class, and when you come to verse 16, I'd ask him, would you share with me, what does your personal study guide say about verse 16? Verse 16 is one of those passages where it can be interpreted one way or another and uh, gives them an opportunity to uh, contribute to the discussion. But it also is, again, once more reinforcing the idea, I'd like for you to study and prepare before we have our Sunday school lesson. Read that personal study guide. It has value and you can contribute to the lesson. And then after that's explained in verse 16, then go on to verse 17, they should be for you alone, there it is again, and not for you to share with strangers. And then notice the joy in verse 18. Let your fountain be blessed and take pleasure in the wife of your youth. Now on the board, I intend to write the word pleasure, and then across from that, the word uh, exclusivity, and then the word joy. Pleasure, exclusivity, joy. Th this, is, this is God's design. This is following God's design. But this is not 
following the world's design. Now, they agree with the idea of pleasure, that sexual intimacy gives pleasure, and they agree with the idea that there should be joy that comes into your life. But if you're not having pleasure and you're not getting joy, then the world would say, you need to change this issue of exclusivity because you're supposed to be happy. But the Bible doesn't do that. You see, the Bible does, the Bible puts this before us and it confronts us with our, our lack of willingness to deal with the issues. You, you see, we, it's easier to just back away or to find someone else than to actually, actually confront the issue of why we're not experiencing pleasure or why we're not experiencing joy. And what happens is we miss out on the opportunity to grow and to mature and to develop as God intended us to be. So uh, we, we, we will never experience this deep closeness that God wants for us to have and what we wanted on our wedding day unless we keep this design in place, pleasure, exclusivity, joy. And if any of those three are lacking, then this means there's opportunity for you and me to grow in our relationship. It's not a matter of your spouse getting with the program. It's you learning how to love your spouse in the way that God designed them. Now, our lesson may seem to have nothing to say to singles and widows. Well, it does have a great deal to say to singles, but, but God has created us with these desires and these passions. And then he placed us in a physical world in which those desires and passions can be fulfilled. But what if your context is not where you can legitimately fulfill them as a married couple? Well, God still has that, uh, that desire for a purpose. And what he's wanting to do is for those desires to find their fulfillment in him. And, and sometimes the best way to do that, if there is not a way in which to legitimately, biblically fulfill those desires, is through investing your life in the good of others. There's something rewarding, you know that as a Sunday school teacher, there's something rewarding in, in living in a way and in investing in a person's life so that their life is blessed and good. And, and also finding a way to have meaningful relationships. It seems as though our churches could do a lot of work when it comes to helping singles and widows and widowers finding a way to have meaningful relationships, though they're not uh, in a relationship where they can fulfill these kinds of physical desires. So the answer uh, to sexual temptation is not just restraint, but it's pouring your life into what is true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable and morally excellent. The way I hope to close my lesson is there is a there's a card, uh, I'm going to give the, or my class a card, and it has this statement from Randy Alcorn. And the statement says, uh, purity is always smart, impurity is always stupid, not sometimes, not usually, always. You are not the exception, I'm not the exception, there are no exceptions. And I'm going to give it to the class and ask them to keep that, to think on this lesson, uh, to reflect back upon it. And it could be that that's a card that they'll want to pass on to someone else uh, in their family and give them an opportunity to talk about this lesson. Thank you, friend. You know, sex is uh, the subject of some of the major issues that we're facing in our society. You just can go down the list from abortion to same-sex marriage to the LGBTQ community and their issues uh, to all kinds of social things that involve uh, the support of children and divorce. It just, it's just a widespread subject. And what is it that our society needs? 
starting with the church, we need to teach them to follow God's design. Do you see how important what you do is? And thank you for doing it. I'm praying for you. God bless you.